Dogs are often referred to as man's best friends. For roughly 30,000 years, dogs have lived alongside us, helping us hunt and also protect our homes and family. In this video, we'll take a look at how, when, and why dogs were domesticated by humans. Please enjoy. There is archaeological evidence that dogs were the first animals domesticated by humans more than 30,000 years ago. Some people may argue goats were the first. Domestication supposedly began when wolves started scavenging food scraps from humans, who then began to domesticate the wolves, providing them with shelter and protection. In return, the wolves helped the hunter-gatherers with hunting large prey. Some experts studying the evolution of modern dogs believe that domestication was a conscious effort of humans. The theory was that ancient people took wolf pups from their dens, adopted them, fed them, and trained them. This is based on the behaviour of modern wolves. It is extremely difficult to tame a modern wolf past the age of 19 days, as they have already began picking up new habits from their pack and their mother. Raising a pup that is at max 13 days old, however, is possible, and much easier, as the pup hasn't opened its eyes and hasn't observed the behaviour of its parents or pack. Dogs' domestication began with social selection, which means that dogs who were more social towards humans benefited more than those that were more introverted and wary, despite them both living alongside humans. The more social dog would benefit from more food and protection from the human tribe, as they would develop a bond. This ultimately means that the more social dog is more likely to survive and reproduce, making future populations more social and friendly towards humans. Later in the timeline of domestication, dogs were influenced by artificial selection, which was down to human influence. We will talk about this more later in the video. At a burial site in Czech Republic, a dog was discovered buried with a bone from a mammoth placed in its mouth after death. It is believed to be 32,000 years old. In Germany, the skeleton of a disabled dog was buried with the bodies of a man and a woman. Radio Carmen dating puts this at 14,300 years ago. This is a unique early example of the developing connection between humans and dogs, beyond using dogs for practical purposes only. Other early dog burial sites were discovered in many other places. The mummified black dog of Tamat in Russia is thought to be 12,450 years old. And in Israel, there are 12 individuals buried, one with their hand resting on the body of a small puppy, dating back at least 12,000 years ago. From at least 6,000 years ago, dogs were a part of many leading civilizations. Anubis in Egypt, Shalot for the Mayans, and Cerberus in ancient Greece. Their role was either to accompany the deceased people to the other world, or to guard the other world. The genetic divergence between the dog's ancestors and modern wolves occurred between 40 and 30,000 years ago, just before or during the last glacial maximum. It's important to note that this was the beginning of domestication, not the completion. One of the most important traditions in human history was the domestication of animals, which began with the long-term association between humans and hunter-gatherers, more than 30,000 years ago. The dog was the first species and the only large carnivore to have been domesticated. Predators we see kept as pets today, like tigers, lions, bears, and even chimps, are not domesticated. The domestication of dogs predates agriculture, and it's not until 11,000 years ago, in the Holocene era, that people living in the Near East entered into relationships with wild populations of boar, sheep, and goats. Where the domestication of dogs took place remains debated. However, evidence suggests that dogs were domesticated in Eurasia, with the most plausible proposals being Central Asia, East Asia, and Western Europe. The oldest known skeletons are found in the Altai Mountains in Serbia and a cave in Belgium, dated 33,000 years ago. According to studies, this may indicate the domestication of dogs occurred simultaneously in different geographical locations. For a long time, scientists assumed that dogs evolved from the modern grey wolf, but a study published in 2014 concluded that this was incorrect, and that dogs are descended from an extinct type of wolf. The first dogs were certainly wolf-like, however, the changes that coincided with the dog-wolf genetic divergence are not known. Identifying the earliest dogs is very difficult, 
because the key morphological characteristics that are used by zoo archaeologists to differentiate domestic dogs from their wild wolf ancestors, size and position of teeth, and the size and proportion of the cranial and postcranial elements were not yet set during the initial phases of the domestication process, so early dogs and wolves look very similar. If the earliest dogs followed humans, scavenging on carcasses that they left behind, then early selection may have favoured a wolf-like morphology. Perhaps when humans started staying in one location longer and building larger camps, dogs became closely associated with them, making selection favour a smaller and more distinct dog. Animal domestication is a co-evolutionary process. The earlier association of dogs with humans may have allowed dogs to have a profound influence on the course of early human history and the development of civilization. The question of when and where dogs were first domesticated has stressed geneticists and archaeologists for decades. Genetic studies have suggested a domestication process commencing over 25,000 years ago in one or several wolf populations in either Europe, the High Arctic or Eastern Asia. There is clear evidence that dogs were derived from grey wolves during the initial phases of domestication. The wolf populations that were involved are likely to be extinct. Despite numerous genetic studies of both modern dogs and ancient dog remains, there is no firm consensus regarding either the timing or location of domestication, the number of wolf populations that were involved, or the long-term effects that domestication has had on the dog's genome. Humans and wolves both exist in complex social groups. How humans and wolves got together remains unknown. Domestication is a process that is difficult to define. The tomb was developed by anthropologists with a human-centric view in which humans took wild animals and bred them to be domestic, usually in order to provide improved food or materials for human consumption. That tomb may not be appropriate for a large carnivore such as the dog. This alternate view regards dogs as being either socialised and able to live among humans, or unsocialised. There exist today dogs that live with their human families, but are unsocialised and will threaten strangers defensively and aggressively, no differently than a wild wolf. There also exists a number of cases where wild wolves have approached people in remote places, attempting to initiate play or to form companionship. This view points towards the fact that before there could be domestication of the wolf, there had to have been a socialisation. Continuing on from the few theories I mentioned earlier on in the video on how dogs were actually domesticated, there are some more theories I would like to discuss. One theory on how dogs were domesticated by humans is the campfire theory. Ancient DNA supports the hypothesis that dog domestication preceded the emergence of agriculture and was initiated close to the last glacial maximum when hunter-gatherers preyed on megafauna and when early dogs might have taken advantage of carcasses left on site by early hunters, assisting in the capture of prey or providing defence from large competing predators at kill sites. Wolves were probably attracted to human campfires by the smell of meat being cooked, first loosely attaching themselves and then considering these part of their home territory, where their warning growls would alert humans to the approach of outsiders. The wolves most likely drawn to human camps were the less aggressive subdominant pack members with lowered flight response, higher stress thresholds and less wary around humans, therefore making them better candidates for domestication. This theory is supported by social selection. The second theory is called the Migratory Wolves Theory. On the Mammoth Steppe, the wolves' ability to hunt in packs, to share risk fairly among pack members, and to cooperate moved them to the top of the food chain, above lions, hyenas and bears. Some wolves followed the great reindeer herds, eliminating the unfit, the weak, the sick and the aged, and therefore improving the herd. These wolves had become the first pastoralists hundreds and thousands of years before humans also took this role. One study proposed that during the last glacial maximum, some of our ancestors teamed up with those pastoralist wolves and learnt some of their techniques. Many of our ancestors remained gatherers and scavengers, or specialised as fish hunters, hunter-gatherers and hunter-gardeners. However, some ancestors adopted the wolves' lifestyle as herd followers and herders of reindeer, horses and other hooved animals. They harvested the best stock for themselves while the wolves kept the herd strong and this group of humans was to become the first herders and this group of wolves the first dogs. The remains of large carcasses left by human hunter-gatherers may have led some wolves into a migratory relationship with humans. This could have led to their divergence from those wolves that remained in one territory. 
A closer relationship between these wolves or early dogs and humans may have then developed, such as hunting together and mutual defence from other carnivores and other humans. Microsatellite assessment of two wolf populations in North America combined with satellite telemetry data revealed significant genetic and morphological differences between one population that migrated with and preyed upon caribou and another territorial population that remained in a boreal forest. Though these two populations spend a period of the year in the same place and though there was evidence of gene flow between them, the difference in prey and habitat specialisation has been sufficient to maintain genetic and even coloration divergence. A study has identified the remains of a population of extinct Pleistocene wolves with unique DNA signatures. The skull shape, toothware, and isotopic signatures suggested that these were specialist megafauna hunters and scavengers that became extinct while less specialised wolves survived. Similar to the modern wolf that has evolved to track and prey upon caribou, a Pleistocene wolf population could have began following mobile hunter-gatherers, meaning they slowly acquired genetic differences that would have allowed them to more successfully adapt to human habitat. The third theory is the food partitioning theory. Dogs were the only animal to be domesticated by mobile hunter-gatherers. Humans and wolves were both persistent pack hunters of large prey and were competing in overlapping territory and are both capable of killing each other. One study proposes how humans may have domesticated such a dangerous competitor. Humans and wolves are members of the large carnivore guild and when there is abundant game, the top members leave carcasses for other members to scavenge. When game is scarce, there is often conflict. Humans are usually members of this guild because their ancestors were primates, therefore their ability to process meat is limited by the capacity of the liver to metabolise protein, and they can only derive 20% of their energy requirements from protein. High protein consumption in humans can lead to illness. During the harsh winters of the last glacial maximum, plant foods would have been less available, and meat would have not been the favoured food, but fat and grease would have as is prized by some high-latitude dwelling people in modern times. Game meat would have been devoid of fat, but the limbs and crania contain fat deposits, and limb bones contain fatty oils. There is evidence of such processing during this period. Wolves are typically carnivores, and can survive on this protein-based diet for months. Calculations of the lipid content of Arctic and subarctic game available across the cold steppe environment at this time and today shows that in order to gain the necessary quantity of fat and oils, there would have been enough excess animal calories to feed either early dogs or wolves with no need for competition. Hunting together and protection from other predators would have been advantageous to both species, leading to domestication. How does domesticating dogs benefit humans? Well, early humans moved from scavenging and small game hunting to big game hunting by living in larger, socially more complex groups, learning to hunt in packs, and developing powers of cooperation and negotiation in complex situations. As these are characteristics of wolves, dogs and humans, it can be argued that these behaviours were enhanced once wolves and humans began to cohabit. Communal hunting led to communal defence. Wolves actively patrol and defend their scent marked territory, and perhaps humans had their sense of territoriality enhanced by living with wolves. One of the keys to recent human survival has been the forming of partnerships. Strong bonds exist between same-sex wolves, dogs, and humans, and these bonds are stronger than other same-sex animal pairs. Today, the most widespread form of interspecies bonding occurs between humans and dogs. In 2003, a study compared the behaviour and ethics of chimpanzees, wolves and humans. Cooperation among chimps is limited to the occasional hunting episode or the persecution of a competitor for personal advantage, which has to be tempered if they were to become domesticated. One might therefore argue that the closest approximation to human morality that can be found in nature is that of the grey wolf. Wolves are amongst the most gregarious and cooperative animals on the planet, and their ability to cooperate in well-organised groups to hunt prey, carry items too heavy for an individual, and babysit the pack's young, even when it isn't their own, is only rivaled by that of human society. 
Similar forms of cooperation can be observed in two closely related canids, the African wild dog and the Asian dole. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that canid society and cooperation are old traits that in terms of evolution predate human society and cooperation. Later into the human reign, dogs served different purposes. As humans began to gain more influence and control over the world, they discovered that they could breed dogs to look and serve just how they wanted them to. Different cultures of people were responsible for different breeds of dog. For example, the Norwegian Lunderhund, which was bred in Norway to hunt puffins, or the Saluki that first appeared in Egypt and was used to hunt gazelle, or maybe even the Golden Retriever, a breed that appeared more recently used to retrieve small game, mostly birds, that hunters and farmers had shot down. More recently, they are used as guide dogs and sometimes used in the emergency services to find and locate stranded people. In modern times, lots of dogs that were used for practical purposes are now kept as pets. I personally have a golden retriever named Ivor. Although I don't want him to retrieve small game for me, I want him to be my companion accompanying me on long hikes and walks, but also adding a wonderful nature to my home. This is the relationship most people have with dogs all around the world. But some people still use dogs for practical purposes. German Shepherds, Rottweilers, Bloodhounds and Labradors are all used in the police force. Famously, Border Collies are used to herd animals for farmers. And Siberian Huskies are used as sled dogs working in packs to pull resources or even people on the backs of sleds across the snow. On the darker side, some dogs were bred purely for looks and fashion, and unfortunately, the result of this is a mutated dog with low life expectancy and constant health issues. Take the pug for example. Pugs have various health issues due to selective breeding influenced by humans. They are most likely to suffer from obstructive airway syndrome as well as an eye, ear or skin infection and various breathing problems. Bulldogs also have breathing and skin problems as well as ear diseases and eye disorders. This is due to both breeds having a small compact face and no long snout like other dogs. If we look at the ancient pug that dates back to China, we can see that the pug had a longer snout like most other healthy dogs. The same can be said about the ancient bulldog species, which had a longer snout and a regular lean body instead of a small stocky build with a large compact head with no prominent snout like other dogs we see today. This is called de-evolution, which means the species is evolving to become more primitive and less successful. However, this is only a concept as the whole idea is based on if evolution has a purpose and if it's progressive. Dogs are so evolved in human life that a lot of modern breeds would fail to survive in the wild as they lack physical capabilities as well as the mental skills and knowledge. Dogs have had an enormous impact on our society. The bond between humans and dogs is so strong that people have died to save their own dogs and dogs have died to save their owners. Dogs would risk their life in a heartbeat to protect their owners. They love us unconditionally even though they don't understand everything about us. They truly are man's best friend. Thanks for watching today's video. If you enjoyed and want to see similar content, then please like and subscribe. Also, if you have a suggestion for a future video, then please leave a comment. Thank you.